Welcome everyone to the second Aging Geroscience and Longevity Symposium organized by eLife. I am Dario Valenzano uh, and I will be co-chairing this uh, symposium together with, uh, with Sara. I'm a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne and um, Germany. And uh, I am uh, a, uh, an editor, like a reviewing editor at eLife. And I also was uh, a speaker in the previous uh, um, in the previous symposium, in the first uh, symposium. Yes. So welcome, everyone. My name is Sara Hagen. and I'm co-chairing this uh, session today, symposium with Dario. Uh, I'm an um, associate professor at Karolinska Institute, and I work with the molecular epidemiology of aging, so a lot of human data. Uh, and it's a pleasure to doing the second symposium uh, on aging, neuroscience, and longevity organized by eLife today. So Sarah and I today will uh, alternate in uh, moderating uh, the, the various talks, uh, but we will be both present uh, at the whole time. The whole time. Uh, and uh, well, I'd like to say that it's very exciting that uh, uh, eLife had uh, this this initiative and. Uh, uh, to bring together a community, not just uh, um, via like a, uh, uh, an issue, a special issue on aging and geroscience, but also by giving the chance uh, to all the, the authors to, to meet virtually with, uh, with the broader community. So this is really like a great platform. And it's, it's, an, it's a very interesting experiment. And I look forward to, to being part of it and to see how it unfolds. So I think that uh, just uh, like the previous uh, uh, symposium that was held in December, also this one really reflect, reflects um, how the field of uh, biology of aging has uh, evolved over the past uh, 20 years from uh, very molecular, very mechanistic to much broad uh, and uh, uh, encompassing everything from theory, from evolution and epidemiology. And with a very, very, uh, uh, you know, a lot of attention towards uh, uh, applications and medical um, consequences of, uh, of the research that we conduct every day. Um, so yeah, so there will be nine talks um, and uh, there will be now, I guess Sarah will explain a little bit the, the various, uh, um, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, we have some housekeeping rules, rules today. Yes. Uh, yes, as you said, Dario, we will have nine talks today and they will all be 15 minutes approximately in the presentation. And then we have a few minutes uh, for questions for each uh, speaker. So please, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat and we will post them to the speaker. And if you want, you can also write, uh, write your name and affiliation and your type of research position uh, if you want to share that as well. We will also have a 20 minutes break about um, half time through this symposium. Um, and what else? Yes, we have um, all the, the presentations uh, will be recorded today. And this will then be available through the eLife uh, website after the symposium has ended. So you can even watch it afterwards if you miss some, some parts of it. Uh, yes. Did I miss something, Dario? No, I think that's uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. So uh, we hope that uh, you will be participating, uh, and we encourage also students to be active and ask questions. Uh, we'll read your questions, um, and I think we are uh, ready to start. Right. So then I I will uh, move on and introduce the first uh, speaker. And this first uh, presentation is a recording. And uh, the speaker is Broke Sanko from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And the talk of, of uh, the title talk is Dietary Sterol Trade-off Determinants Lifespan Responses to Dietary Restriction in Drosophila melanogaster Females. So as this um, talk is a recording, uh, it's not possible, unfortunately, to ask questions, um, live questions to the speaker. So this is, will be the exception for today. 
but for all the other talks, uh, you can post questions in, in the chat function. Um, so with that, I think we can start with the first talk. Everybody, my name is Brooke Zanko, and I'm a PhD student in the Piper Lab. Um, thank you for coming and listening to my talk today. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there live at the symposium. Uh, I just don't know how great my talk would be at 1 or 2 a.m. here in Australia. Um, but I hope you enjoy it. And what I'm going to be talking about is actually my first paper. And we looked at the role of micronutrients in both lifespan determination and reproduction in Drosophila melanogaster. And specifically, we focused in on sterols. So first, I want to quickly just talk to you about diet and health. Um, so we know that what an animal eats throughout its life can have significant effects for its lifelong health. And specifically, one way of extending the lifespan of animals has been, uh, which has been shown across a broad range of organisms, is dietary restriction. So this involves restricting the, the amount of calories that an animal was able to eat throughout its life. And this produces lifespan extension effects. Uh, it's been observed across a broad range of organisms, including yeast, Drosophila, which we're studying in our lab, monkeys, and many different other many other animals. I'm just going to quickly show you what exactly this effect I'm talking about looks like. And this is in Drosophila. So going forward, all plots or anything of that sort will be uh, Drosophila based because that's what we study in our lab. Um, so on the x-axis you can see we have food concentration and this is going from low to high and on the right y-axis we have the lifespan and on the left y-axis we have fecundity. So this is our lifespan here. And we see on the high food diet too we've got lifespan coming in at about just under 60 days. Then as we dilute the diet we see the lifespan increases and increases further as we dilute it more. And then it drops off dramatically as once we dilute it too far because then the animals are malnourished. Then here we have fecundity and we use fecundity as essentially a measure of health because the more offspring that an animal is able to have, the more evolutionary success it's gonna have in the wild. Um, and you can see that here where the lifespan is reduced is actually where we have the highest number of uh, offspring and then this goes down as we dilute the food further and further and this um, what you're seeing here is being formalized into a mechanistic theory it was done by Tom Kirkwood in 1977 and it essentially postulates that uh, animals that the, the soma and then the reproductive organs, organs are competing for limiting resources. And so when resources are abundant, then the animal will reproduce as much as they can. And uh, this comes at the cost of the soma. However, when the animal is resource limited, what it will do is it'll basically switch off reproduction and as a result, the soma will receive priority supply of nutrients, and this allows the animal to put off reproduction until a later date when nutrients are more available. Um, so moving on to some more recent findings, um, we've actually been able to mimic the effects of dietary restriction by modifying the macronutrients in the diet. And so what you can see here, and the details of this are unimportant, but what I wanna show you is that we have two different traits. So these are pairs of data. And on the left, we have lifespan. And on the right, we have lifetime eggs for different animals. And protein here and carbohydrate here. And what you can see is that these traits are actually maximized at different protein to carbohydrate ratios. So we see that it's not necessarily the amount of calories that an animal is eating. It's just that these two traits are maximized. They have different optima. So they're maximized at different points on these heat maps, um, which is where 
I don't know if I mentioned, but where it's red, this is where that the trait is maximized. And you can see that in general, a high protein diet encourages high levels of reproduction, while a low protein diet is where we see lifespan be maximized. Now, kind of moving to something slightly different, I want to actually talk about what goes into making an egg and the decision for Drosophila to lay an egg. So when the fly is eating these really high protein diets, they're laying a lot of eggs and there are nutrient sensing mechanisms in Drosophila that tells them when they have uh, the, the amount of protein or carbohydrate that is in their diet and it tells them how many eggs that they should be laying because these macronutrients are of course very important for both egg production and survival and they don't want to overcommit to reproduction and run out of these resources so when they're eating the high protein diet they're laying lots of eggs but the thing is that eggs are not simply comprised of protein and carbohydrates they're made up of an abundance of different nutrients including micronutrients and the thing about these is that micronutrients are not as tightly uh, regulated or monitored in the body of drosophila as the macronutrients are so when a certain micronutrient is running low the fly might not actually realize because it's assumed that it should be receiving these micronutrients from its diet however this is not always the case so in the case in which the fly is eating a really high protein diet so it's laying a lot of eggs but its diet is lacking in a specific micronutrient that is really important for both egg production and somatic maintenance. The fly may therefore overcommit this micronutrient to reproduction and as a result, deplete itself of this resource completely resulting in early death. So we wanted to look at this in Drosophila to see if maybe this is actually what's going on and this is what explains the effects of dietary restriction. And so we chose to look at sterols. And the reason for this is because it doesn't appear that uh, Drosophila actually has a sensory mechanism for sterols. So you can't actually tell when it has run out of sterols almost completely. And this, this micronutrient is also very important for both egg formation and egg production, as, as well as somatic maintenance. So to look at this, we designed a series of diets you can see another heat map here and the details are a bit unimportant. It's just some prelim preliminary uh, uh, findings that we had that helped to inform our decision for creating each of these diets. And so we have three PDC ratios and three caloric, caloric levels here. Um, so we have a protein dilution series and a carbohydrate dilution series and the open circles are our diets. So we have five different diets. Um, and this is all done using a halitic medium, by the way. So this allows us to manipulate each individual nutrient um, independently of the others. So this is perfect for looking at variance in cholesterol levels at different PDC ratios. So what we did was we had our five diets and we had four different cholesterol levels for each diet. So that was zero, low, medium, and high. The medium is called medium because it's our standard uh, amount of cholesterol that we put into our fly's diet. So quickly I'm just going to show you what these phenotypes look like when we vary the P to C ratio. And here you can see we have our survival plots on the left. Protein is in red at the top and green is carbohydrate. And here we have lifespan as circles, and it's the same as this data here, basically, but just condensed, and the same for carbohydrates. Now we see, as we would expect, that the lifespan is maximized on the intermediate PTC ratio. On the high protein diet, the fly's lifespan drops off. And on the really low protein diet, it does the same, it drops off. And we see that egg output increases as we increase our protein. Carbohydrate is almost the same, except it's just reversed, um, except we see that lifespan is actually maximized across all of these 
TDC ratios, which is also to be, to be expected. Um, and we see here that on the low carbohydrate is when they are laying the most amount of eggs and this reduces the more carbohydrate that we add to the diet because this is increasing, this is decreasing the PVC ratio. So now what happens when we modify cholesterol? And I'm gonna show you first, this is our protein series and then after I'll show you our carbohydrate series. So we have cholesterol going from low to high here, as you can see. Um, and this is our, in the, the square, we have our medium level of cholesterol. And this is what I showed you before. So we see that on the high protein diet, uh, lifespan is reduced and it increases as we reduce the protein and then drops back down as we reduce the protein too much. When we add more cholesterol to the diet for our high cholesterol diet, we don't really see any changes in these effects. Um, we see that the high protein diet still is where uh, lifespan is reduced. However, when we begin to dilute, redu reduce the amount of cholesterol in our food, we see that there is a significant decline in lifespan on the high protein diet and that egg laying doesn't really change. Um, and then when we dilute it even further, we see that lifespan decreases even more for the high protein diet and it also drops down for the intermediate PDC ratio. Um, interestingly though, our low protein diet, there's very little variation in lifespan. Um, and this is also the diet which lays the least eggs and the diet which is most affected by the reduction in cholesterol levels is the diet in which uh, the highest level of egg production occurs. So now for carbohydrate. So again, we have our uh, medium uh, cholesterol level um, in the square. And this is the same as I showed you before where lifespan remains high across all of these conditions and egg production is highest at the low carbohydrate level. Um, and then for the high cholesterol level, we see that there is no real change in these phenotypes, they remain the same. But then when we begin to reduce the cholesterol, we see the same as before. The uh, diet which encourages the highest level of egg laying begins to drop off dramatically in its lifespan here. And as we reduce the cholesterol even more, it drops off further and the intermediate level of uh, protein and carbohydrate so drops off. So what we're seeing essentially is that when the fly is laying more eggs, they're more susceptible to a cholesterol deficiency. So if this is true and there is an indirect trade-off occurring here, then we would expect that by stopping the flies from laying eggs, by making them infertile, uh, we would be able to uh, alleviate them from this sterile deficiency and therefore extend their lifespan. So we thought a great way to do this is of course to add rapamycin to the diet because that stops egg laying and that's exactly what we did. So here you can see we have our low cholesterol diet and when we add rapamycin to this diet, we see that lifespan is extended here in the open red circle. Um, lifespan is significantly increased when rapamycin is added to the diet. However, oh, sorry. Interestingly, when we add sufficient levels of cholesterol to the diet in the uh, black circles, we see that lifespan is also increased to the same extent as which rapamycin increases lifespan. And we see the same when both cholesterol and rapamycin are added to the diet. So this essentially shows us that the, the way in which rapamycin appears to actually be extending lifespan is that it stops egg laying, which stops flies from depleting themselves from sterols. Now, finally, we wanted to check that these effects aren't just limited to the halitic diet, that we can replicate these results in a yeast-based media, which is what is used by many different labs to study dietary restriction and the mechanisms behind dietary restriction. So what we did was we had a low yeast diet and a high yeast diet. And to each of these diets, we either left them as they were, or we added 
uh, 0.3 grams per liter of cholesterol. Now, what you can see in this open dark orange circle is our high yeast diet, and it lives a significantly shorter life than our flies fed a low yeast diet in the open yellow circles, which is exactly what we would expect. Um, interestingly here though, we see that when we add cholesterol to the diet, so to both the low yeast and the high yeast diet, we are able to extend lifespan significantly um, to the point at which these two diets are almost um, indistinguishable. Um, and interestingly, it actually seems that the low yeast diet is sterile limited. So summarize all of kind of what I just showed you. We have a fly, it's part of its life. It's got a full level of sterols. And then we put it onto a high protein diet. One diet is sterile sufficient. There's a high level of sterols in this food. The other one is sterile limited. Both of these um, flies on these different diets, they go on to lay lots of eggs and have lots of baby flies. Um, this fly, however, who has a sterile sufficient diet, goes on to live a long, happy life um, with a full amount of sterols because they have enough sterols to allow them to support both reproduction and maintain somatic maintenance. The difference is this fly here that's on a low sterile diet will still have a lot of offspring, but it will die young um, because that it is depleting itself of its sterols to maintain that high reproductive output. And the result is early death. So to summarize all of this, essentially the effects of diet on lifespan depend on balancing several nutrients simultaneously. And what happens is we're seeing one phenotype, right? but there may actually be multiple causes as an indirect trade-off or protein toxicity, for instance. Um, so it's important to consider that just because we're seeing the same phenotype occurring, there might actually be different mechanisms behind this, this same effect. And finally, and importantly, um, although sterols are not likely to be an issue in mammals because mammals can synthesize their own cholesterol, the effects of diet restriction in these animals may actually be explained by other micronutrient deficiencies. So we know that we can extend the lifespan of mammals by diet restriction, and it's very possible that there may be indirect micronutrient trade-offs occurring here as well. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Piper Lab as well as the Mirth and Scro Labs. So I hope you all enjoy the symposium and have a great day. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much, Brooke, even though you're not here and we don't have the chance to ask questions. I think we can already move to the next speaker. Uh, Sarah, is there anything you wanted to add? I, I could just add that uh, all the, um, the papers, the published papers are available on the eLife website from the talk. So if you're interested to read more about um, uh, some of the topics, you can find it online and also for Brooke, that was not uh, available live today. Exactly. Thank you, Sarah. So um, before we start with the next talk, I also would like to say that uh, at the end of each talk, uh, I will read the questions that will uh, be asked on the chat. So please, uh, as soon as you have a question for the speaker, write it down, you write it in the chat, and uh, maybe at the end of the question, you can Tell your name, say your name, your affiliation, and whether you're a student, postdoc, PI, or uh, if you work in the industry. And uh, uh, and I will read your question. Um, so and then um, uh, I, we can move to the to the next speaker. So Fernando Monje Casas. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly the name uh, from Cabimer Cabine and the Spanish National Research Council in Spain. And the uh, title of his talk is Aging at the Poles, Asymmetric Inheritance of Spindle Microtubule Organizing Centers. And Fernando, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for, um, for giving the talk. I will 
turn off my video and I will turn it on after 12 minutes to signal that uh, uh, the time is arriving to an end. Okay. Okay, great. All yours. Thank you. Uh, I cannot share my uh, screen. Uh, you have to allow me to, to share my screen. So, oh, here we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Now. Great. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to first, obviously, thank, uh, thank him by thanking uh, uh, Eli for organizing this symposium and, 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 and inviting me to present uh, the research that we have been doing in the lab for the last uh, few years that has to do with uh, 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 regulation of asymmetric sound divisions. And obviously, also all, all of you for or attending in, in, in a virtual uh, manner. Uh, uh, if you uh, uh, think about a, an asymmetric subdivision, uh, uh, basically uh, two things must happen. Uh, uh, and uh, this is first the polarization of the cell along a predetermined axis, okay? And then uh, to ensure that the uh, genomic material is uh, uh, distributed uh, according to this polarization, uh, uh, the cells must ensure that the mitotic spindle is oriented uh, 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 parallel uh, uh, to this uh, polarity axis. Um, the mitotic spindle is a bipolar array of microtubules that uh, allows for the segregation of the chromosomes. And uh, interestingly, this uh, 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 structure is uh, itself uh, an asymmetric uh, 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 structure in its own nature. And this is particularly true at the level of the microtubule organizing centers, the MTOCs, which are these uh, structures located at the poles of the bipolar array uh, and from which the, emana uh, the microtubules that form the spindle emanate. Uh, the MTOCs are known as the centrosomes in higher eukaryotes or the spindle pulvaris in Madingis. Now, when the cells are uh, duplicating, uh, they only have one of these MTOCs. But soon after they start cell division, uh, the uh, MTOCs are going to duplicate. And uh, interestingly, it was uh, uh, found originally in the Badinges that uh, the uh, microtubule organizing centers can be asymmetrically inherited. Uh, and specifically in, in Cervicia, what was found is that the all spin up body is always uh, inherited by the daughter, while the new spin up body is retained by the mother cell. This was later shown to be uh, an evolutionary conserved phenomenon and that uh, can be observed in uh, during the division of, of uh, many stem cells in different organisms, including humans. Uh, we have uh, recently shown that the asymmetric inheritance of the spindle of the bodies uh, is necessary to maintain the replicative lifespan uh, of the badinges. And this is uh, due to the fact that this process is essential to maintain normal levels of the expression of the sir 2 sir 2 in and also to uh, uh, maintain also the transport of functional mitochondria into the daughter uh, cells. Uh, two processes that are required to uh, preserve uh, the protein aggregates and, and malfunctional protein within the context of the mother cell during cell division. Uh, therefore, when uh, this uh, 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 spindle pool body inheritance is somehow uh, uh, perturbed, we have uh, an accelerated aging. Thus, we're uh, interested in, uh, in understanding mechanistically how asymmetric uh, distribution of the microtubule organizing centers is uh, uh, established and maintained by the cells. And uh, we are uh, in the lab, uh, not only looking at the consequences, but also uh, trying to understand the mechanisms leading uh, to this phenomenon. Uh, uh, we know already some, some of the players and, and, and not surprisingly, maybe some of them has to do with the, the process of the spindle positioning. Maybe the, the most uh, 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 important protein in this sense is the carnine protein, which is the homologue of the 
adenomatous polyposis coli, the APC protein in humans. And this, this protein is interesting because it loads on, on uh, the old spin depot body uh, in metaphase. And from there, it's gonna travel through the microtubules towards the tip, where it's gonna bind a myosin motor that traveling through actin cables is gonna push the old spin depot body into the daughter cell. We know uh, also other players such as the SUI1 kinase, uh, components of the MEM pathway, which is the equivalent of the uh, HIPPO pathway in, in mammals, or the most upstream component that we know so far, which is the SPC72 uh, uh, protein, which is a gamma tubulin complex receptor, all of them working to the red CAR9 towards the old spin of body. However, uh, the picture is still not complete. And as I mentioned before, we're still looking for, for new uh, factors that intervene in uh, regulating asymmetric spin of body inheritance. Uh, we knew that, that, that Polo, uh, which is a, a protein kinase of an important family of cell cycle regulators, uh, was necessary to establish the mother-daughter central asymmetry in, in the neuroblast of Drosophila. And CDC5, which is the G's uh, polo homolog, uh, was shown to uh, localize to the spin double virus in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So uh, we decided in the lab to analyze whether uh, polo kinase could have a, a role in the asymmetric inheritance of the spin double virus in Manningis. Uh, to analyze spin double body inheritance in Badenges, uh, we use a methodology that you can see here uh, that basically is based on using a, a, an inner component of the spin double body tagged with a slow folding red fluorescent protein. And uh, due to the uh, conservative nature of the spin double body duplication, uh, uh, this uh, allows us to uh, distinguish the old from the new spin double body based on differences in fluorescence, okay? Because the newly uh, 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 generated spin double body mostly incorporate non-fluorescent protein. Now, if we do this and we compare wild type cells with cells that express a CDC5 allele that we can conditionally inhibit with a, a ATP analog, you can see how in exponentially growing cells after inhibition of CC5 activity, we get a randomization of the spin of poor body inheritance. Uh, uh, this indicates obviously that uh, polo kinase does indeed play a role in asymmetric spin of poor body uh, uh, trait determination. We then start uh, looking for possible targets of the kinase at the spin of poor bodies and that obvious first candidate was uh, uh, SPC72. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's a gamma tool in complex receptor uh, from the CDK5 RAP2 family because it was uh, shown to be phosphorylated both in vivo and in vitro by CDC5. Uh, SPC72 preferentially localizes to the pre-existing spin of the body in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's not a full uh, asymmetric localization, such as that of CAR9, but it is uh, obviously enriched. So the first thing that we did is to uh, check whether uh, the distribution of SPC72 changes uh, after uh, uh, inhibition of polo-like uh, kinase activity. Indeed, uh, similarly to what happened with the spin the body fate, uh, as you can see here, distribution of SPC72 was randomized uh, after uh, inhibition of CDC5. However, when we look at the association of SPC72 with the all spin of body, you can see how it was my, uh, still maintained after CDC5 inhibition, which indicates that the CDC5 role in SPV uh, fate determination uh, was either downstream or in palaver to that of uh, SPC72. In any case, since uh, uh, CC5, as I told you uh, before, uh, 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 phosphorylates SPC72, we uh, uh, check whether there were other aspects of SPC72 function that could be regulated by the kinase. Uh, to this end, we synchronize cells in G1 and allow them to progress synchronously into the cell cycle. And uh, we analyze uh, more carefully the localization of SPC72. 
uh, SPC72 localizes to the only spin that body that is there in the in uh, a cell enter the cell cycle, but soon as uh, the uh, uh, spin double body duplicates, as I mentioned before, is going to asymmetrically localize to the only uh, uh, to the old spin double body. However, as cells reach anaphase, this, the uh, uh, protein becomes more symmetric. However, in the absence of CC5 activity, you can see how the protein remains mostly asymmetrically localized. Not only this, what we observe if by looking at the uh, total fluorescent levels is that you get a, a reduction in these levels, indicating that CC5 regulate both the timing and loading of new molecules of SPC72 to the spin up bodies. Uh, we then uh, 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 continue by looking at other possible targets, and then we focus on CAR9. Again, CAR9 was ran uh, randomized in an asynchronous cell culture, but in contrast to what happened with SPC72 in this case, the lack of CC5 activity did perturb the preferential association of CAR9 with the pre-existing spin up body. Carnide, in fact, has uh, other localization uh, in the cell, not only to the spin up bodies. And we also observe that the protein was uh, nuclearly retained uh, in these conditions and uh, 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 localized to uh, uh, the, uh, the inner uh, microtubules of the spin up. Uh, so these and other observations led us to propose that what CC5 is doing uh, uh, is to promote post-translational modifications in carnine that promotes this nuclear export and its association to the old spin up body. Finally, we look at the independence in SPC72 and carnide localization. And we uh, demonstrate that in a carnide mutant, SPC72 localized normally, but SPC72 is essential for carnine to localize. Then uh, we look at the possible interdependence between the three uh, 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 proteins, the interplay between SPC72, CAR9, and CC5. And then uh, by co precipitation, we demonstrated that SPC72 and CAR9 associate, and the association diminished uh, in, the, in the absence of CC5. And not only that, uh, uh, in the absence, there is an increase in the number of cells that display opposite uh, uh, localization of both protein. So finally, uh, uh, just to conclude, this is the model. What we propose is the CDC5 as, as a molecular timer that establishes spindle pull body fade by promoting an efficient temporal and spatial recruitment of SPC72 and CAR9 uh, to the uh, spindle pull bodies. Okay, so with this, I just want to end by uh, thanking the uh, uh, funding and uh, the people, acknowledging the people that did the work. It's mostly uh, done, uh, work done by a really talented student in the lab, Laura Matellan, with the help of uh, also extremely talented postdoc, Javier Manzano. And with that, I uh, just wanna thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any, any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Fernando, for the great Great talk. I would like to remind everyone to please post your question on the chat. So far, there's just one message from uh, from Anya. So please do post questions for Fernando uh, for your team. So maybe I can start with a with a question, Fernando. Mm -hmm. So I was actually uh, so this is definitely not my my field, but I was surprised to learn that the daughter cell uh, receives actually the old M M talk. So. Uh, and so that means that mother cells always get uh, get a new one, right? Because every 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 time they form the new one, they will then uh, transmit it to the new daughter cell. Is that right? Is that say, say it again. Sorry. So I was surprised to 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 to, to learn that uh, daughter cells uh, inherit the 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 you know the the M, the old M talk in a way, like the mother. Yeah. And so that means that at every division the mother cells forms a new a new one basically right yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, the, the mother cells is always provided with a new um with a new m talk and so that means that somewhere in a clonal line of of yeast there will be one uh daughter cell that has a very very old <laughs> uh, you know uh, yeah. and i was wondering whether it's possible to trace 
the age of this mTOR and whether that has any impact on uh, on re replicability or any age-related uh, uh, phenotype in in MISTO. Well, uh, you know, I guess that at some point, you know, so it, it, it's true what you're saying. So uh, basically, uh, the 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 uh, 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 there's always going to be a, a a cell that is going to uh, maintain the, the the older, but at some point, you know, there is even though the the, the uh, uh, duplication of the spinal body is uh, conservative, it's not fully conservative. It's semi-conservative. There is some, you know. There is some renewal of the protein. So at some point, sure. you know, uh, the, 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 there is renewal and there is a reconstitution of the spinal body. You know, it's, it's just that it takes uh, longer. It's, but but the, the, the thing with the difference in the uh, 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 inheritance is that uh, you inherit different post-translational modifications right. in, this, in, the, in the proteins that, you know, that made the spin the body. And to me, I think that, that this is the most important, it's the information that you are receiving together with that uh, uh, spin up body, you know, it's not that much. Uh, so if you consider the history in that sense, then yes, it, it is important. Now, uh, one thing uh, is that in not in all organisms is always the, the same, um, uh, um, uh, uh, is is the all spindle body that one that goes to the daughter cell? Okay. okay. In some divisions, okay. For example, in Drosophila, uh, in in the neuroblast, uh, is the same pattern, but mm -hmm. in the germline stem cells, is the opposite. Okay. Mm -hmm. But interest, interestingly, as supporting our idea of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, relationship of this process with aging, what is true is that. It is uh, uh, the uh, uh, the cells that 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 retains the uh, all spinal pool body that one the ones that is going to live the longer. That's right. You know That's I mean? the counterintuitive so, part. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you know, following up on that, maybe. So I mean, I guess yeast cells. Correct me if I'm wrong. They can also undergo sexual. Uh, reproduction right so you can also have meiosis right i was you, wondering yeah. i was wondering in the context of meiosis rather than you know fission due to to, to mitosis whether you have a reorganization or whether this uh, this symmetry breaks in a different way um or whether uh this has little to do with the whole duplications observed no, in so it's a very interesting question but we haven't ha haven't checked anything in, in terms of you know uh, meiosis and and and, yep. and uh, you know since it's a, uh, uh, it's a let's say you know uh, you have two divisions in which you have uh, you know it's actually more symmetric of a symmetric uh, uh, state. I don't I, I haven't actually you know look into 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 this. You know we focus on the mitosis because it's you know the stereotype of uh, asymmetric cell division. You know? Mm -hmm. And so, but then can you connect causally the inheritance of the older SPV to the uh, long longevity, like as, or, or as an organizer of, uh, uh, yeah, so how, how, how can you, how can you, you know, mechanistically uh, tie this event with, uh, with the cytoplasmic reorganization that may have some uh, activations, gene expression or epigenetic activation that may be uh, understood in the field of molecular biology of aging as kind of like. Well, uh, that's what we are trying to do right now, okay? Because uh, so so basically we're moving in two directions. One, make the mechanism, which is the the the, the focus of this talk, because obviously you know it was what we published in in in, in the context of this uh, uh, special issue. But then we are also trying to analyze the consequences and uh, of uh, interfering with this process and uh, in terms of aging, and, and 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 you know we know that we are affecting mitochondrial transport. Mm -hmm. We know that we are affecting uh, uh, CIR2 uh, CIR2 levels, and 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 we know that we are affecting protein aggregate retention, and we know that if uh, uh, we uh, 
overexpressed situin because we have a reduction of situins, we have a rescue, a partial rescue of the phenotype. We know that by also uh, uh, rescuing the mitotic phenotype, we also have, uh, sorry, the mitochondrial phenotype, we also have a partial rescue of mm -hmm. the, but uh, the, the, the actual mechanism, we are still looking into it. So for example, we know that uh, we, we is, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, still not published, but we are looking now into what uh, happens with CIR2. And uh, uh, we know that CIR2 uh, is actually not only the global levels, we, know, we don't think that CIR2 is, 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 is doing uh, 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 something specifically at the spinal pool bodies. We don't think that the protein itself is localized in there. We don't have reasons to believe that it's localized in there. We, we, we believe that it's something downstream, but we clearly see that there is a, a, a not only a global uh, a decrease in the levels of CIR2, but also uh, uh, the pattern of association of CIR2 with chromatin is clearly different and 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 you know and that there is a group of of of, of you know of genes that that you know are uh, affected by by the, uh, reversing the, the the process. In terms of mitochondria, we also know a transporter that is specifically affected. So maybe you know this transporter that needs to be. Uh, 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 move into the daughter cell, somehow this uh, uh, needs uh, uh, the uh, intervention of the spinal pool body to be properly, you know, established. So, you know, we, we are looking into the, the proper mechanism, but even though we know the pathways that are affected and some of the players, we still are far from understanding the whole picture. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando. Thank you. All right, so I think we can uh, move to the next speaker, uh, who's Sarah Mouton um, from the ERIBA, I think, in Groningen, so the European Research Institute for the Biology of Aging, and the uh, University Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands. And the talk uh, of Sarah's, uh, the title of Sarah's talk is A Physico Chemical Perspective of Aging. Thank you very much, Sarah, for, uh, for presenting your work. And I would like to remind everyone to post your question in the chat and uh, I, will leave, I will read it uh, uh, once uh, the uh, talk is uh, over. Sarah, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dario, and hello, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, so to jump right in, uh, in our lab, we are interested in the yeast, Acromyces cerevisiae, uh, which is also known as Baker's yeast, which among other cool things can make delicious bread and beer. Uh, well, more particularly, we are interested in how this single cell organism is aging and what drives aging, the aging process in uh, yeast. So I'll just briefly introduce you to the yeast uh, replicative aging model. So when a yeast cell is born, it starts putting off daughter cells and it will do so approximately every one and a half hours. And with each division, the mother cell completes it will acquire aging phenotypes, um, which, however, will not be inherited by the daughter cell. Due Sarah, to the can I interrupt you a second? Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Think, uh, can you please share the presentation? Because I think that we are still not seeing I thought it. I was sharing it. No, we cannot see Oh, it. Oh, I'm very sorry. No problem. Oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. Now we can see it. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, right. Um, just move this away. Yes, so uh, replicative aging model. Um, yeah, so daughter cells will not inherit uh, these um, uh, aging uh, phenotypes due to the asymmetric division. So, uh, sorry, just to um, get a pointer. Yes. Um, so a mother cell will, uh, well, the number of divisions a mother cell completes determines the um, replicative age. And after approximately 25 divisions, a mother cell will senesce and die. Uh, on the other hand, daughter cells will um, 
just um, be reset to age zero and they will be born with a full replicative life potential. So many aging phenotypes uh, have been described in yeast and most of them are classified under the well-known hallmarks of uh, aging. Um, however, how these hallmarks are connected with each other is um, uh, still not known. So one common factor between um, aging and longevity associated molecular um, layers is the intracellular environment in which um, they take, uh, they fulfill their function. So we know that there is a physiological optimum uh, at which macromolecules uh, function. And for example, the cytoplasm is packed with macromolecules whose concentration has been proposed to be maintained at the limit of their solubility. Furthermore, we know that in aging, this uh, effective solubility of proteins is decreasing, leading to aggregate formation. However, what is interesting is that old cells do not have increased total protein concentration compared to young cells, which means we need to better understand uh, the physical chemical state of the aging cytoplasm to understand how old cells are different compared to young. Uh, and furthermore, we also need uh, more data and more tools uh, to further investigate that, which brings me to the aim of our paper. Um, which was to construct an initial framework of physical chemical homeostasis uh, of yeast replicative aging. Now, there are many physical and chemical parameters that determine the intracellular physiology. Uh, however, we focused on three, which we were most interested in, which are uh, pH, macromolecular crowding, and volume. So we first addressed uh, the pH, and what we saw is that in H cells, the cytosolic pH is decreasing by roughly a half a pH unit on average. And furthermore, what we saw is that there is increased heterogeneity in the old population. When we plotted single cell lines from the cytosolic pH versus replicative H, we saw that this heterogeneity mostly stems from the senescent phenotype of these cells, because Early in the mitotic lifespan, there is a progressive decline in cytosolic pH, and somewhere around the senescence entry point, there is a sharp acidification of the cytoplasm. So when we increased our imaging frequency to be able to pinpoint when exactly this acidification happens, we saw that cells first become senescent, and only afterwards, the cytosol acidifies significantly, which means that cytosolic acidification most likely is not a driver in senescence, at least in yeast cells. Now, we were uh, interested also in this early decline in pH because previously described mechanisms could not fully explain why is this happening. So next to proton pumps, uh, metabolites and amino acid side chains, which are on protein services, uh, can suffer, well, can uh, function as a buffering capacity, uh, can function as a buffer, I'm sorry, um, and they provide buffering capacity against pH changes. And so um, what we did is we combined several data sets and uh, we estimated the proteome isoelectric point in aging. And what we were surprised to find out is that early pH changes actually follow very nicely the proteome PI. And we think that this decline in buffering capacity of the proteome potentially is at least in part a driver of this early acidification in aging, which also um, uh, correlates to lifespan. So um, actually it's a problem that the cytosolic uh, pH is decreasing and it's a problem in terms of uh, tool usage. Um, because if you want to use fluorescent biosensors, then they are sensitive to pH changes and they're also sensitive to uh, division frequencies. So this was also the case with the golden standard FRED pair, which is a CFP and a YFP, and which is usually applied for fluorescent biosensors, because this FRED pair is impacted both by the variable division frequency of yeast cells and by the pH changes. So what we did is we tested several FRED couples to see what would be the best approach to uh, tackle this problem. And I can't show you the data right now. I don't have time for that. You can read it in the paper. Uh, but we found this MEGFP and MSCarlet to be 
uh, much better uh, threadbare to withstand the challenging intracellular environment, and therefore it provides much better readouts. And furthermore, this optimization, as far as we know, uh, should be applicable to all thread-based sensors, therefore being a well ubiquitous um, aging tool for future aging applications. So now with um, our optimized tool, what we decided to do is to follow macromolecular crowding in single cell uh, aging. And we were kind of surprised to find out that despite dramatic cell volume changes, um, there was, uh, well, macromolecular crowding seemed remarkably stable. However, there was a little bit of increased heterogeneity and we also saw that um, there is a weak correlation between uh, the ability of longer lived cells, well, the ability of cells to maintain their macromolecular crowding uh, and, and replicative lifespan. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we were quite surprised to find out that there is such dramatic increase in cell volume and yet macromolecular crowding is stable. And so what we did is we contacted our collaborators in Yale from the Lost Club uh, because we knew that recently they have obtained images of old and young cells uh, through correlative light and electron microscopy. And so we were interested to follow the cytoplasmic volume, but also other organellar volumes, which we were able to identify in these images. And so what we were able to find out is that in old cells, um, vacuoles occupy approximately 30% more volume relative to the total cell volume versus young cells. And furthermore, uh, the cytoplasm occupies 25% less volume compared to in young cells. And we were not able to identify any significant changes in the nuclear volume fraction between young and old cells. So to further follow up on uh, biological consequences from this increased organellar crowding, we estimated interorganellar distances between young and old cells. And what we found out is that in young, most common distances are 500 nanometers, while in old cells, this is reduced to only 100 nanometers. And assuming that the viscosity of the cytoplasm between young and old cells is the same, we see that a 20 nanometer particle will diffuse from one membrane to another 60 times faster. And for a 40 nanometer particle, it will diffuse, well, it will encounter a membrane 400 times faster compared to in young cells. And so, just to give you a flavor of what cell components are in this size range, these are large molecular complexes such as uh, ribosome polymer, uh, RNA polymerase II, and also ribosomes. Um, yeah. So just to conclude, uh, we have taken the first steps to explore and construct a physical chemical roadmap of, uh, of, of yeast replicative aging. And we found that in two out of the three parameters we studied, um, there is a change. And we see that old cells are crowded with organelles, there is increased membrane surfaces and highly reduced interorganellar uh, inter uh, distances. Despite these dramatic changes, we see that macromolecular crowding on the level of single protein is well-maintained in aging, particularly so in longer lived cells. And we think that this would suggest that maybe macromolecular crowding is tightly regulated. We don't know that. We don't know how macromolecular crowding is regulated at all in cells. Um, and we think that uh, big changes in macromolecular crowding are most likely not compatible with life. Furthermore, we see that the cytoplasm is acidifying uh, early in aging, and this follows the proteomysoelectric point. And upon senescence, the cells further acidify dramatically. And finally, uh, we provided uh, a tool, a new optimized tool, um, which we hope that will uh, help further studies in aging to address other physical chemical parameters. And finally, in the future, we'll be interested to see what are the consequences of these changes and also how they can help to tie together some, at least, of the hallmarks of aging. And with this, I would like to take the, thank the organizers for providing me with the opportunity to uh, present our paper today. 
also my supervisors, Lisbeth Weinhoff and Arnold Bursman, my colleagues from the Weinhoff Lab, our, our collaborators um, and uh, funding. And I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for a great talk. Thank you also for sticking to the time. And uh, there are a few questions. So uh, the first one is from Craig Walling um, from uh, Edinburgh, uh, is a PI. So do the cells that show the biggest change in pH show the most aging in other traits? Yeah, that is a good question. So we follow pH independently from the other parameters. Uh, although we can see actually whether these cells have large vacuoles, um, but it has not come to my attention whether these cells that have large changes in pH, they will show other uh, traits. But for sure, these are cells that um, live shorter and usually they senesce faster and also they divide uh, a little bit slower. So indeed, they do have some other aging phenotypes uh, there. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. There is another question, uh, this time from Steve Canham. It is known if, so is it known uh, if the decrease in cytosolic pH um, is potentially related to leaky lysosomes, impaired autophagy in aging, for instance? Um, yeah, this is a great question. I think I've gotten this question before also um, on the conference. Um, we have not seen the vacuole rupture. Um, it's possible that this is a very, I, I would presume if it happens, this is a very quick event. So it could be that with the imaging frequency we had, we have not seen it because we imaged once every 10 hours and later once every one hour. Um, so it could be that just in the 80 cells we analyzed, we never uh, encountered this. So it could be happening, but we haven't seen it. We have seen it, I think, in the clam images, but you know, it could be that these are also artifacts from a sample prep. All right, thank you. So there is another question from uh, Gada Al Saleh. So she says, great talk. Do you think that this inhibits the pH? Uh, so this, this uh, leads to autophagy and uh, lysosome and this leads to protein aggregation. So I guess whether these changes in uh, pH um, leads to autophagy uh, and changes in protein aggregation directly, causally. Um, yeah, I don't know anything about autophagy, whether it's uh, promoted or inhibited by changes in cytosolic pH, uh, to be honest. Um, yeah, I would have to look that up. Um, whether it leads to protein aggregation, we don't know yet. There was an experiment we wanted to do where we wanted to tag HSP-104 um, and then fluorescently, and then see whether there is like aggregate formation upon cytosolic acidification. And I'm happy to say this experiment is done now, but we haven't analyzed it yet. So I cannot tell you the results yet, but I think it's a very valid question and we don't know. But what's interesting is also, you know, if the pH changes and it hits the isoelectric point of certain proteins, then they, they become less soluble and they can precipitate. So in principle, it is possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is a question from Martin Bagic. Uh, do we know anything about why uh, the pH, uh, no, the, the PI of the buffering proteins decrease, decreases with age? I think it's pH. Uh, is this specific to yeast? Oh, that's a good question, actually. I'm not sure whether, we don't know whether this is specific to, to yeast. I haven't seen any other papers on that. Um, yeah, and why is it decreasing? I guess the proteome composition is changing. Uh, I have to say our prediction carries certain, well, some uncertainties um, related to, well, PI predictions and also to aggregate formation. Now, one of our reviewers pointed that out actually that, you know, proteins that will aggregate will impact differently the proteome isoelectric point. Um, so yeah, we don't know why that, why that is happening. I would presume, uh, yeah, 
it can be the other way around too. You can be that the cytosol is acidifying and then the proteome is adapting to this new environment. That is also possible. Exactly. I was thinking, I was thinking whether actually these responses are compensatory uh, or truly dysfunctional. That's oftentimes uh, the big question uh, in, uh, in the aging field. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. I actually have a quick question regarding crowding. So, uh, so do you think that this is actually uh, a big problem with aging also in other cell, in other systems, in other cell types, whether molecular crowding actually leads to traffic jam and to, to um, functional impairment? And uh, if the answer to that is maybe or yes, do you think that there are cell types that are more crowded than others. And how do you think they solve this, this issue? Probably this, question, this, this problem has been already tackled by evolution, probably. Um, yeah, so your question is how, whether there are cell types that have increased crowding and how, yeah, how they tackle this. So that's a good question, I think. And for example, it has been proposed that in bacterial cells, crowding is, for example, the highest. And then potentially it's reduced in yeast cells. And for sure, it's known that in mammalian cells, the crowding is even less. So, you know, like membrane organizations for sure promote, um, well, they say, I, I guess you get more of cellular, intracellular organization. And this is how it's tackled um, uh, this problem. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Sara. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we can move to our next speaker, who is the last speaker before our first break. And uh, uh, so Dr. Andre Parkit Parkitko from the Aging Institute of UPMC at the University of Pittsburgh um, in the USA. And the title of uh, Andre's talk is Tissue-Specific Manipulations of Methionine and Tyrosine Metabolism Extend Drosophila. Lifespan. As uh, as I said before, please, if you have questions, do uh, ask uh, in the chat. Do write it down in, in the chat. You can add your um, affiliation as well, and I will read them after uh, Andre's presentation. Andre, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for organizing this symposium. It's it's really great, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my data today. So, uh, different labs we use variety of omics approaches to study aging. So I'm very interested in how metabolism changes with age and whether we can target these uh, change, age-dependent changes to extend health and uh, lifespan. And to do this, I decided to use Drosophila as a model system because we can quickly manipulate different metabolic pathways there. And to start with, I decided to use a model from Trudy Mackay Laboratory. So we developed uh, flies uh, that were selected for exceptional longevity. And so I use these flies uh, to do metabolomics at different ages. And so when we compared how like, metab like uh, general metabolism changes in control flies and in, in flies with this exceptional longevity to see whether we can see differentially affected uh, metabolic pathways. And so when we started with uh, the first metabolic pathway that uh, appeared in our analysis was methionine metabolism. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just because we uh, published this uh, before. I just wanted to uh, discuss our model so I can move forward. So methionine uh, that we get either from food or from our microbiota. Uh, so half of these would be used for protein synthesis, but half of these would be used for uh, metabolic needs. And so methionine will be converted into essential methionine which is or SEM, uh, which is the major methyl donor in our cells. And we have a uh, few hundreds of different methyl transferases uh, that use uh, this methyl group from SEM. And after it donates methyl group, it will be converted to essential homocysteine or SEG, uh, which actually can competitively bind to these methyl transferases and inhibit them. So it is very important for cells to keep an uh, appropriate amount of essential homocysteine in our cells and uh, converted to homocysteine and back to methionine. And so what we found that uh, when uh, flies age, they will accumulate uh, amount of SEG and homocysteine. And so if we can uh, find a way how we can reduce this age-dependent accumulation, for example, they can do it via uh, methionine restriction when we uh, reduce amount of methionine in food, 
for the activation of a flux, uh, via methane metabolism, the activation via of this enzyme, which is called H superteen or SEC in the, uh, humans. So when we can extend health in lifespan. But the, another interesting question actually is, can we define a specific organ uh, where methionine metabolism is important for aging and for regulation of lifespan? And we cannot do it simply by uh, reducing the amount of methionine in uh, fly food, just because when we reduce the amount of methionine in food, we will reduce amount of methionine in you know, all different organs. And actually it could be uh, by different extents in different organs. So what we decided to do is uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to use this enzyme called methaninase. So it doesn't exist in humans or in flies, but it exists in uh, different bacteria. And so this enzyme will degrade methanin to uh, free volatile substances that can be easily uh, excreted from, uh, from blood or from uh, hemolymph. And so we created uh, transgenic flies where we can uh, induce expression of these enzyme methaninase. And so we uh, analyze these slides. I will quickly uh, uh, walk you through this slide. So here in red, you can see flies, like regular flies, which are maintained on regular food. And in, in light blue, you can see flies that were maintained on chemically defined food, where we know each component in this fly food. And so, and that has one millimolar methane. So, we, oh, sorry, in dark blue. And you can see that these flies has, uh, have the same amount of methane in this uh, flies in the control diet. So meaning that one million of methane is what we have in, in control food. But then when we uh, either completely remove uh, methane from this food or we express this enzyme uh, methaneinase, we can almost completely wipe out uh, methane from our flies. Or we can, for example, uh, change amount of methane, uh, like uh, slightly decrease it and we, call, we can cause methane restriction. So it's, it is interesting when we uh, increase the amount of methanin, so the level of methanin itself would not uh, increase, uh, increase, but when you we analyze downstream metabolites, I don't show them here, so they will uh, sky up, meaning that you know, cells they have uh, keep a uh, proper amount of methanin. And so when we analyze downstream metabolites, for example, like I showed here SAM, but we analyzed uh, more metabolites, so we will follow the same pattern as we observe for methanin. So meaning that these uh, enzyme methaninase could be a very efficient tool to uh, deplete uh, methanin in, in a tissue specific manner. And so we started to analyze uh, which, uh, like using uh, different tissue specific uh, inducible drivers uh, to see which tissue would be responsible to depletion of methanin and extension of lifespan. And here I just uh, wanted to show you that when we, uh, when we deplete methanin in intestine cells, so the, uh, the flies actually live uh, much longer than uh, control flies, and they live over 100 days, which is uh, quite long for flies. And I also want to mention that this uh, recombinant form of this uh, enzyme uh, has been used in different cancer studies. So we can actually uh, like give it to uh, humans and to reduce plasma methane in, in humans, and potentially we can translate uh, our studies uh, into mammalian systems. Okay, but the big question is, uh, can we identify other metabolites uh, that are responsible for aging and can we manipulate these pathways to increase lifespan? And here, I, I want you show, uh, to show the heat map of all different metabolites uh, that change differently with age in control and lonely flies. And um, uh, so many of them actually you would recognize as you know, very well known players in, uh, in aging, for example, NADP, but one metabolite uh, that attracted our attention and also amino acids uh, is tyrosine. So it tends to decrease in control flies with age. But when you look on the lonely flies, to different species, like lines of lonely flies, it would actually uh, significantly increase with age. And just to remind you, again, tyrosine, like uh, part of tyrosine will be used for protein synthesis. But so the main uh, role of tyrosine in our cells is to produce uh, tyrosine-derived neurotransmitters like dopamine, octopamine, and tyramine and octopamine and tyramine were analogous to epinephrine and norepinephrine in humans. Alternatively, tyrosine can be degraded via the tyrosine degradation pathway to produce acetoacetate and humorate, so it can feed into the TCA cycle and play an aplerotic role. Because we found that the level of tyrosine changes uh, with age, so we asked the question, so whether the levels, levels of enzymes in tyrosine degradation pathway, which would control uh, tyrosine degradation would also change with age. And if we found that several enzymes transcriptionally upregulated uh, with age in control flies. 
And so we use JP trap for the first and rate limiting and timing, the tariff degradation pathway, for the minimum transfer rates, and we found the uh, uh, protein level of his time also is, is increased with age. So interestingly, what uh, we found, so if you take young flies and actually disrupt mitochondrial fu function in these young flies, uh, they're using RNI against uh, mitochondrial electron transport chain. So that would dramatically upregulate the level of tarzine amino transferase and, and cause this um, uh, upregulation of tarzine degradation pathway in the young flies, like phenocopian agent. So when we then proved that this tyrosine amino transferase is really required for tyrosine degradation, so what we did, we used CRISPR-Cas9 approach and we uh, generated null flies for tyrosine amino transferase. And like, if you like absorb the lifespan for just for a month, so the lifespan will be similar. And so when you, but when you apply excess of tyrosine in, in, the, in the fly food, so, homo, so wild type or heterozygous flies, uh, they would not care about this. But homozygous flies, they will start acutely dying just in a couple of days. So meaning that this enzyme is really important for degrading, degrading extra amounts of tyrosine in a uh, normal situation. So because uh, the level of uh, tyrosine tend to decrease in control flies, it is high in long lived flies. And uh, because uh, levels of enzymes and tyrosine degradation pathway also increase with age. So we wanted to ask a question. So what happens if the uh, suppress these enzymes. So how does it affect lifespan? So we downgraded the tyrosine amino transferase with uh, weak and strong RNI uh, in whole body. And we observed that these uh, flies have uh, extended lifespan. And similarly, if we downregulate it to other enzymes, like downstream enzymes in the tyrosine degradation pathway, we also can extend lifespan. So meaning that if we suppress uh, tyrosine degradation pathway, we can extend uh, Josephine lifespan. So, so we then ask a question, so whether there is a specific tissue which is responsible uh, for this uh, regulation of uh, lifespan. So we uh, downregulated tyrosine amino transferase in different tissues, and we found if you use a uh, neurospecific uh, gene switch driver uh, to suppress tyrosine amino transferase, so when it, it actually extends lifespan even more efficiently uh, when, when you suppress it in a uh, whole flight. So meaning that it has, you know, own pros and necks to uh, suppress it in whole flies, probably like it is required for normal aging in, you know, in other tissues, but it is uh, specifically detrimental when it is upregulated in uh, neuronal tissues. So as I mentioned to you before, like one of the main roles of tyrosine is uh, production of tyrosine-derived uh, neurotransmitters. So we use uh, these uh, wild type and homozygous flies that we generated uh, to, to test the levels of uh, different tyrosine derived neurotransmitters in collaboration with D.V. Ramish and Axel Brockman in Bangalore. And as expected, when you suppress tyrosine degradation pathway, the level of tyrosine itself is going up. And we found that the levels of uh, different neurotransmitters is also upregulated. And here you can see the levels of dopamine and tyramine, and we found the same for octopamine. And interestingly, when we uh, compare just the level of uh, neurotransmitters that are not derived from tyrosine, so the levels uh, don't change. So it is not just general response for different neurotransmitters, it is specific for uh, tyrosine-derived neurotransmitters. Okay, and just to understand a little bit the mechanism, uh, how this type is uh, responsible for regulation of lifespan. So we use several reporters um, for processes that, that are known to, uh, to be relevant for aging. And we found, like we used GTD, uh, found that the level of GTD JFP, uh, which reflects the amount of oxidative stress, would be increased in you know, control flies, it, it would be expected. Uh, but when we suppress the amino transferase, uh, so we uh, suppress this uh, uh, accumulation. And actually, so when we, so, like, consistent with this, when we uh, feed flies with parapod, so we can. Uh, uh, increase their res resistance to oxidative stress. So potentially one of, one of the potential mechanisms how this inhibition of tyrosine degradation pathway with extend lifespan is uh, increasing their resistance to oxidative stress. And uh, finally, just to, to finalize uh, so, uh, our data, so we believe that in young flies, a majority of tyrosine actually is used to, for the production of uh, dopamine, tyramine, and octopamine. And uh, so when flies age or like somehow they have mitochondrial dysfunction, so cells, they try to compensate uh, loss of uh, mitochondrial function and they reroute uh, tyrosine from making neurotransmitters into 
uh, the TCA cycle, so that actually would suppress production of neurotransmitters. And actually, we know that from different model organisms and from uh, human studies that uh, their levels would be decreased with age, and it would further aggravate the mitochondrial function. And I just want to mention that uh, there are two uh, different FDA-approved drugs. Uh, one is called nitizinone, which, uh, which is an FDA-approved drug and that would suppress tyrosine degradation. And another uh, drug, which is called tiger cycling, that inhibits mitochondrial translation. I didn't show you this data, but when you inhibit mitochondrial translation, you can uh, suppress this uh, mitochondrial dysfunction-induced upregulation of uh, tyrosine amino transferase. And at the end, I just would like to thank Norbert Perimont, my former mentor at Harvard Medical School and other people in Norbert Lab uh, who helped me with this project, uh, my collaborators on this project and uh, our funding. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Great talk. We have several questions. So the first one is, uh, what is the concentration of RU486 used with the ticks males and when is the inducer applied? Yes, it's a great question. So we only apply RU486 in adult flies, usually starting at day seven. So when all development uh, you know, is already finished and we have adult flies. Uh, so I believe we use 150 micromolar concentration of uh, RU486, like as you know, most other people in fly field would use for these genetic drivers. Thank you. This question was, by the way, by Michael Rira. Uh, so, what happens if you suppress tyrosine degradation later on in life? It's a great question. Uh, so, we never tested it by ourselves. So, I so so it would be like great to test if we, you know we can make more translational conclusion and you know suppress tyrosine degradation pathway with RNI or even with the drug in all the flies. I think sometimes the problem. So, we haven't tested it because we need you know a lot of flies and uh, uh, we, we haven't done it. Uh, but also some people uh, argue about, uh, you know, invisibility and tissue specificity of gene switch system in all the flies. So, and I, I don't know, it could be a problem. So I, I have, we haven't tested it, uh, but it, it would be great to do. Sorry, maybe I missed this, but uh, do you see different effects in males and females? Yes. Uh, so we see different effects in males and, female and females. Uh, so for example, so it's yeah, it's a bit complicated question. So, uh, so for example, when we use neurospecific driver and express okay. against tyrosine amino transferase, we see extension only in females. But then you can argue that females actually eat more food, and uh, so they consume more RU486 from the food. So you don't know whether males. Uh, so we don't see extension of lifespan in males uh, because they eat less and they get less inducer and you know less okay. uh, down regulation or it's just because it's, you know, male to female, you know, specific fashion. And I, I think it's an amazing question. So we, we saw a lot, of, we, we see a lot of sex specificity and it's something, it is something that we would like to address in the future. Cool, thanks. There's a question from Sarah Hack. Uh, would suppression of tyrosine also be expected to extend the uh, uh, lifespan in humans or maybe associated with more healthy states or organs in humans? Yeah, it's a great question. So what we are doing right now, so we got a pilot fund from the paper center and so we are going to take old mice, uh, which are really old, and you know feed them because I'm interested in tyrosine and in methionine metabolism. So we are going to target both methionine and tyrosine metabolism in really old mice and see whether it would suppress like felt index and you know different phenotypes associated with uh, aging. And I should mention that again, both methionine metabolism and tyrosine metabolism you can uh, target with you know either FDA approved drugs or drugs that have been used in humans like recombinant methionine. So I think if you can see a good effect in mice, then you know we should think about how we can translate it into humans. There is a, one more question from uh, Kurshid Wani. Have you specifically tested the role of neurotransmitters or the neurons that produce these neurotransmitters? This is from UMass Medical. Yes, yeah, so it's a yeah again a very interesting question. So we so we, we, what we tried we, we we took just wild type flies and we fed them with, you know, uh, octopamine, tyramine, uh, and uh, uh, dopamine uh, at the concentration that have been shown before in flies to rescue, you know, this, uh, like, deficiency of these neurotransmitters, like with different genetic models. So we found a slight extension of lifespan. And uh, so, so, like, again, but it, it wasn't as great as we uh, absorbed with down regulation of tyrosine transferase. 
And again, there are multiple explanations for this. It could be just because when you feed neurotransmitters, you don't see you know, distribution of these neurotransmitters like to different neurons. Uh, we never child, we never uh, located you know, specific neurons which are responsible uh, for these phenotypes. And again, it would be great to test. But I also want to mention that there was a recently very interesting paper in uh, cell reports when people showed that if you feed octopamine, uh, it would actually phenocopy effect of diet restriction uh, without, oh, sorry, effect of exercise and without exercise. <laughs> so it's, uh, so, so I think it, so it would be interesting to like, you know, power test, you know, interaction between your know, initial transmitters and, you know, right. so Are the tyrosine levels in long-lived mutant flies or in flies that undergo DR uh, dramatically affected? Uh, in DR? Yeah, and in uh, long, also in long-lived mutant, you know, classical long-lived, uh, Mutant. Yeah, so we only tested, uh, so these, you know, selected flies, and we get right. a lot of criticism because, you know, these flies, it's the lifespan is not the only trait, but it's different right, between true. these flies. But, you know, by ourselves, so we, we couldn't uh, measure, you know, tyrosine using like, you know, biochemical heat, uh, so we only relied on metabolomics, and so we haven't tested, uh, uh, you know, other, like, conflict mutants. So it would be great to do, but we haven't done it yet. Right. Thank you so much, Andre. Uh, and I'd like to thank also all the other speakers of this first part of the uh, symposium.